Greetings, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on today's webcast. My name is Dina Evans, and I'm the Senior Manager of Global Events here at Looking Glass Cyber Solutions. Very excited about today's presentation, which is the Modern SOC, Automated Intelligence Tradecraft and the Human Element. And our presenters for today's webcast, we have Chris Kissel, who's the Research Director with IDC, and we have Brandon Dobrek, who is the Senior Product Manager here at Looking Glass. A couple items before we get started, a few quick housekeeping notes. For our Bright Talk platform, please note on the screen there's a chat window. If you guys have any questions that you'd like to submit for our presenters, please be sure and submit it through that feature as you guys don't have audio. Um, but we will be addressing those at the very end of today's presentation, so feel free to submit those um, willingly throughout the whole presentation. We'll do it at the very end. If we happen to run out of time, we will address it directly with you after the presentation, so don't worry. Bring on the questions. Um, also, just a quick note, any questions that you do submit are only viewed by us on the presenter side. So if there's anything that you would like to address privately, just note that in your question. It will be sure to contact you after today's presentation. And then lastly, let's see, we've got attachments and links. There's a, there's a bar there that you can click on and peruse at your convenience. There's some really good content. And then if anyone has, uh, would like CPE credit toward your professional certification for viewing today's webcast and didn't happen to enter that, your membership number when you signed up for today's session, just go ahead and send it to us in that chat screen. It will show us who it came from and we'll be sure that you get your CPE credits for today. Um, but beyond that, there's real, that takes care of our housekeeping notes and so without any further delay, let me go ahead and pass this over to our lead presenter, so Chris. Go ahead and take it away. Yeah, hey, my name is uh, Chris Kissel, and I am the uh, Research Director of Worldwide Security Products at IDC. Today's presentation, The Modern SOC Automated Intelligence, uh, Tradecraft in the Human Element, is sponsored by Looking Glass. I plan to present for about 20 to 25 minutes, and uh, at which point I'm going to go ahead and turn over the proceedings to Brandon and we'll field questions at the very end of the uh, proceedings. Now, I want to mention before I get into the meat of the uh, presentation is, is that in the next few months, IDC is revising our taxonomy to read as Security Arrow. Uh, Arrow stands for Automation, Intelligence, Response, and Orchestration. Aside from the quick plug, I just wanted to make the point about Arrow because for me, Instead of thinking of cybersecurity products as an array of security point solutions, my studies are evolving to consider platforms and the larger incident detection and response lifecycle. Much of this is going to be the topic of the discussion. In the presentation, I will give an overview of the state of cybersecurity today, what the big mega drivers are, where the industry is going, and what IDC recommends and the best practices for people that run security operation centers, and I'll refer to that as SOC from time to time. Okay, I'm going to mention these trends very quickly. There's about seven major cybersecurity trends, and we'll see as we go along that they're interrelated and what it means to SOCs. Obviously, the sophistication of cyber miscreants is growing rapidly. The proliferation of security tool sets, uh, tool sets causes challenges in platform integration, orchestration of tools, and constant renewal and repurchasing of tools. The growing number of environments and devices to protect are changing the concept of network, leading to the death of the perimeter. A shortage of qualified information security professionals has immediate and secondary effects. The continued growth of compliance regulations and the potential schedule of fines for HIPAA or GDPR violations has to be addressed, and there are potentially dire consequences for noncompliance. Note that cybercrime is actually a business with a real ROI. In this vein, and parallel to other types of businesses, there are first movers, and often competitors simply reverse engineer successful strategies. We anticipate that cyber criminals will uh, reverse engineer what happens in the SOC and turn it around to design new threats. And uh, do, do note that the uh, good old phishing attack is still relevant in uh, 2018. We also have to say, who says that malware is the only way to hurt a business and its employees? 
All right. In this slide, it can be uh, a couple of things can be broken down to two basic ideas. Okay, you've got motivations and you've got skill sets. I've mentioned it a couple of times. The phraseology is probably misplaced, but we kind of miss the good old days of on-premise networks um, that were guarded by a stateful firewall, and the attackers were basically run-of-the-mill thieves trying to steal assets or intellectual property. The motivations are now wide-ranging. The Mariah attack, in part, was weaponized uh, consumer devices for DDoS attacks. And DDoS is constantly employed by online gaming companies to discourage customers from playing on one site and perhaps going on to theirs. It's August 29th, and the U.S. general election is about two months away. And there's real concern about tampering in the U.S. elections. Uh, notably, on August 22nd, Microsoft cautioned that there were neutralized websites designed to impersonate the activities of conservative think tanks. The skill set of the adversary is changing both in breadth and in depth. The entry level required to be an effective hacker is lowering, but the sophistication of self-aware malware and stealthy zero-day threats are both escalating. And, but I do want to say uh, quickly, um, just to say that not all is gloom and doom, uh, some of the metrics that we're tracking indicate that both mean time to detect and mean time to respond to breaches is dropping. Do note, though, that the bad guys are always changing their tactics. And I'll give you one example. Last year was the year of malware, and bad actors could encrypt data and hold it for ransom. Now, this year we're kind of seeing a little bit more of Docsware, which is sort of like blackmail. What they do is the bad guys actually gain access to your uh, data and then threaten to release it. Okay. This slide about the scarcity of uh, qualified cybersecurity professionals is definitely cause for alarm. Growing cybersecurity concerns and cha changing IT architectures is driving the need for experienced cybersecurity professionals. A dearth of talent is contributing to rising cybersecurity salaries and creating a cyber deficit, especially for small and mid-sized businesses and companies unwilling to pay premiums for qualified uh, candidates. Different sources put the cybersecurity shortage at somewhere around one and a half million people as of today. Uh, when, that, when a person that designs a SOC leaves, an additional problem arises, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But before we leave this slide, do note that even though there is a shortage of cybersecurity personnel, it really is changing the way that security platforms are designed, security endpoints are designed. And we're finding that necessity is becoming the mother of invention. All right, environmental influences. Um, IDC, IDC has seen three micro, macro trends affecting spending and the design of the Security Operations Center. The first is the dynamic threat landscape, and this is the easiest one to communicate. Just about everyone already understands that the threat landscape is changing, and it's changing for a number of reasons. Um, there's a larger attack surface, meaning that we have more devices, disparate infrastructure, and now global workforces. But additionally, customers are increasing the use of cloud-based applications and public cloud. We'll discuss some of the problems there in the next section, okay? Um, the second major driver is digital transformation, and everybody wants it. Popular apps that help with personal production like Salesforce, Office 365, and Dropbox are cloud accessible. For convenience, companies want employees to have purpose-built devices and mobile access to the network. Part of digital transformation is allowing contractors access to intellectual property and integrating security products with cyber uh, security vendor partners. Uh, these dynamics create advantages, but obviously they also create uh, difficulties in covering the cybersecurity surface. And the last piece is the owner's concept of regulations and compliance. And I have to say, I sort of refuse to get into the deep weeds with it because the topic is ponderous and actually kind of depressing. At, IDA, at IDC, we've actually had internal debates about the meaning of identity. However, exposure of personally identifiable information, PII, is no joke. Uh, in the U.S., a company can be charged $150 for each PII exposure, and it's worse if negligence is found. The schedule of fines that can be levied for breaches caused by non-compliant GDPR practices is horrific. A company can pay up to 4% of its company's annual revenue. Okay, 
Uh, in this slide, this is pretty much a uh, reasonable facsimile of the basic security stack in a SOC uh, for mid-sized businesses through the enterprise. In this, there are technologies within technologies, such as file integrity management, which augments data loss prevention, or network access control for the segmentation of networks by set business segmentation, device type, NMAP, or application use. But these core capabilities are, are pretty much what you needed and pretty much what you uh, could use today. Now note, I started as a cyber analyst about five years ago, and frankly, cybersecurity was kind of fun in an innocent stage. I mean, I know I'm oversimplifying because it was about point products, but if the SOC designer wanted to buy a firewall, they might think of what was the best of breed or what licensing made sense for their environment or what its extensibility was. Now, you know, that's all changing, basically. Many are the problems in designing your do-it-your-own SOC, okay? Uh, I promise to bring back uh, the, the uh, problem with uh, cybersecurity and the shortage. What it means is if you have a key SOC manager or analyst and they leave the firm, uh, for self-evident reasons, that person may have built a SOC that met with his or her eye. Uh, that person was familiar with a specific SIM or vulnerability assessment scanner uh, or just a general way of doing things. Assuming also that that person trains a protege or less experienced analyst, a lot of arcana and a lot of know-how walks out of the door that day. Do notice at the bottom of the screen the traditional SOC stack is yet to account for cloud, Internet of Things, and external threat intelligence. Okay. The trends in cybersecurity slide also promotes the idea of new security considerations, uh, public cloud and cybersecurity, and incident detection and response, occasionally IDR when I, when I get going. Um, I have more or less discussed the uh, new uh, security considerations, the expanding uh, surface, and also the new use cases. I would say similarly, the larger points about public cloud security have been mentioned. I do want to say that the simple idea of remote and multi-tenant is overtaking on-premises and centralized management. There's an evident rise we're seeing in various forms of managed and professional services and threat intelligence as a service, and I actually believe that Looking Glass Scout Prime has a pretty compelling service, but that's kind of Brandon's story to tell. Let's look at incident detection and response. I think of cybersecurity the way that I think of a game of pool, right? In pool, it's no great chore to make any one shot. The virtuosos of the game are thinking of how they want to make the one shot and what the leave is for the next shot. And you actually see it here in security. A prime example is that a SIM can ingest logs for endpoint, next generation firewall, vulnerability management, and external threat feed services. The SIM will likely do a better job of normalizing threat intelligence that comes from inside its network rather than pulling intelligence from a single, much less from multiple external threat feeds. Platforms should work together to create greater defense in depth. An anomaly found on an endpoint should create a restriction on the next generation firewall. Automated response is becoming a norm and not an exception. Last, because dedicated cybersecurity per personnel is, is more of a luxury, often companies have IT and operation guys pulling double duty in security. The bandwidth is simply not there to normalize data or iron out redundant alerts or criticalities. It's really hard to even assign tasks to multifaceted personnel, so security incidents often need to roll up into IT ticketing systems. All right. Here, here's the thing about uh, uh, the traditional SOC-based approach to security, and I've got a, a few problems with it. The first is that a SOC is wholly defensive. I sort of see it like the Great Wall of China. Imposing, yes, but should the wall, the wall is 10 feet high in some places and really it should be 50 feet high at other, others where threats are actually mounting. SOC tools will tell you, yes, there's an anomaly, and they will sound an alert, but while the tools are getting better and analytics are driving changes, some very basic questions need exploring. What is the criticality of the assets under attack? What type of attack is this? Is it a ransomware, a Trojan? Is it exfiltrating, or is it just designed to damage the network? Note that being forearmed is forewarned, but really there, that's kind of what you see at the first blushes of an attack. I know that I'm up against something, but I don't know too much more about it after that. And the second problem with the SOC 
is that I have no idea what is happening to my uh, brand name or my intellectual property in the wild. Cyber squatting is becoming a serious issue. Adversaries can use API, fuzzes, and anagrams of keywords, and then use the same anagrams to make a website look authentic. If a customer is interacting with what she or he or she perceives as the company's authentic website, a criminal can steal credit card information, usernames and password, uh, PII information, and entire websites can be developed that misrepresent the products and the messaging of a company. This slide is a continuation of the ideas that I was developing on the last slide. Uh, obviously, we need to gain visibility outside of the perimeter, and even though the slide indicates a dying perimeter, I do want to make a quick defense of that perimeter, okay? Because there are still reasons to have on-premise networks. The on-premise SOC can design specific defenses for specific assets. Often the most important assets are on-premise. The company website server, uh, the website that faces out for public e-commerce, payroll, and key intellectual, intellectual property is uh, under lock and key. All of this still matters. But really, it's the bulk of work in mid-sized enterprises is moving from inside the network to cloud-based applications and to cloud-hosted environments. The transition to the cloud is magical from a production standpoint. The challenges, however, are, is that when you create virtual machines, every virtual machine is exposed uh, to the Internet. Virtual machines deployed with predefined firewalls are not easily or, or dynamically updated, and anyone with access to the inter Internet can expose bad things. Um, patch management becomes decentralized, and maybe it's not even possible for obsolete devices or new IoT devices and apps that have just gone on to the market. Note that virtual machines uh, inherit the sins of their creators, and there's a whole sec DevOps piece that we're not talking about here. Uh, NoSQL is also open to the Internet, and this is the MMA. This is not like the MMA. No one gets to tap out. I blundered the joke. Oh, heck. Okay. Um, the, uh, the SOC is challenged. I mean, there's just uh, uh, the biggest problem with the SOC is the number of alerts. Um, you know, basically the network is a fluid event. For instance, the relationship between the host and the device changes due to factors such as power outages, uh, new server arrays, or OS uploads. Um, you know, if security tools are not properly retuned, the result is often a false positive. Uh, the number of alerts becomes problematic. Security tools are great, but often alerts are not necessarily security by nature. An employee watches YouTube and while connected to the company VPN. A next generation firewall rule or bandwidth consumption alert based upon role is generated. The employee may be uncool, but that person is not in, engaged in a security risk behavior. IDC has seen studies that suggest as many as 50 to 60% of all alerts are simply not investigated at all. Cybersecurity tools do a great job, but coordinated activities, I mean, that is to say orchestration, is not really easily achieved. Security tool providers are doing a much better job of providing platform integrations, even more than just the standard API scripting. Still, there are so many security point products and so, dedicated, so few dedicated personnel available to, the, to link the technologies. And after the alerts have been sifted through and the tools align, so much still must happen. The analyst still must uh, determine the veracity of the threat, uh, what the adversary is trying to accomplish, and the exploitability of the threat to his own network. Now let's take it the other way. Let's say my SOC is airtight and my personnel is well-trained. IDC conducted an end-user survey last year and asked them what their top three uh, threat vectors were. They are the ho-hum phishing attack, ransomware, and spyware. A phishing attack has more to do with the end-user activity and that is initiated by the end-user rather than any righteous play by the miscreant. There are many activities that are also going to be dangerous but will still occur. Uh, for instance, the HR department is going to open any Word doc with the title Resume. In reality, many employees also use their work computers for personal use. Speaking for me personally, the fill out the survey and win a $50 Amazon gift certificate is awfully hard to pass up. I would also argue 
that an adversary does not need to use malware uh, to be dangerous to an organization. A company would gain benefit if it could find evidence of misuse of branding or if its intellectual property is being repurposed. And it's still about these people. Ultimately, cybersecurity tools should be designed to serve the SOC analyst. We're seeing a few actual uh, developments in SOCs and platform deployments. Machine learning is utilized to do at least these two things. The first is to sift through flow data and end users and reduce the amount of alerts to one, basically designed to eliminate uh, redundant alerts. The second use is to create automated playbooks to help with incident investigation. So the next time that an analyst team sees a, a similar threat, it triggers a, a list of activities in response. If your platform is really cleverly designed, it'll funnel the analyst towards specific investigatory paths and accumulate data in a relevant way, a type of automated trade craft, craft if you will. Platforms should, uh, should tell the analyst what, uh, team what they're up against, really. Um, that there is an alarm or a possible breach is all nice to know, but really doesn't move the needle in response. Self-evidently, the proper response should include the type of threat, and uh, where the who, what, where, and when of the potential adversary is also a plus. The circle of life means that IDR must be thought of as a continuous and virtuous cycle. Once an alert is detected, it must be convicted, and the next step is either to patch or re-image the machine, and also to harden the security surface after that. Lastly, the reality is that security blends into IT and operations. Um, at some place on a platform level, there needs to be a ticketing mechanism where an analyst can hand off completed work to an oncoming analyst. Dashboards or reports that help prove compliance or prove benchmarking are also gaining favor. In most cases, not much is done in regard to gathering information outside of one's own network. Some knowledge can be gained from sensors or honeypots. Um, some security uh, point product providers will send anonymized threat data to all of their customers when new threats are detected, although companies have to opt in for that service. Um, other companies buy external threat intelligence services, and yet still others may have open source sticks taxi feeds. Getting the threat feed data is one thing, but normalizing the data is another. Many times we mention the potential for redundant information. Consider the Not Pet Ya attack launched June 2017 in the Ukraine, fundamentally. Almost every external threat source would tell you that they've detected the threat, but there would have been no mechanism to handle uh, or reduce the multiple threat observances into a consolidated story. External threat feeds are as good as they go. It's pretty likely that an external threat feed service uh, it's pretty unlikely that an external threat feed service will have visibility over the entire internet. Knowing, knowing what the malware is and what it does can be two wildly different activities. Where malware comes from, what extrusion ports it is using, which C2C servers the malware is beaconing on the way out is useful to know because you want to write rules onto your firewall or create blacklists. We mentioned the idea of cyber squatting, and a lot of funny business can occur on what is otherwise a legitimate website. It's absolutely possible that an adversary creates a knockoff website and then skirts the certificate authority system and obtains an automatically generated SSL TLS certificate. The to and from the visitor to the website looks authentic to the browser and likely avoids scrutiny from the uh, web firewall. So the SOC, which can't check for anything, should be able to factor in the age of the certificate or how long the domain name service has been in circulation, as this could be a potential clue towards an indicator of compromise. And the last worth uh, the last point worth mentioning is also worth uh, reinstating. The most skilled SOC analyst is still pressed for time. So given that they may have the skill to integrate all factors mentioned, the source integrity, the data normalization, social media campaigns, malware analysis, you know, a skilled security practitioner may be able to derive a single version of truth. Unfortunately, the process is pretty often trial and error and at the same time, while devoting and discovering and mitigating just one threat vector, uh, that time cannot be regained when multiple threat vectors are occurring. 
So a major part of what IDC does is consider emerging technologies and what IT and security professionals should be on the look for and what kind of tools and platforms to protect uh, that you should be used to protect networks. All right. Um, number one, you want to look for solutions because your job is hard enough as it is. I mean, running a business should be your, your, your big thing that you do. You want to choose solutions that are based on benefits rather than product features. You want to look for the return on investment. Uh, factors that factor in what analyst hours are spent, spent what your mean time to detect and mean time to respond are. You want to design your security architecture considering ease of use as well as efficiency. Work shortage, uh, you're going to find that work uh, force shortage is going to be a chronic problem but the products actually must create advantages for the workforce. You're going to want to find solutions that uh, offer protection without signatures, which helps augment traditional security measures. We're finding that strategic analytics are also a priority for organizations. A solution to the, should enterprise, uh, pardon me, a solution should address endpoint, network, and internal visibility across the entire network. Understanding the specific threat is better than chaining together a series of alerts and finding out what it all means. And the last point I would make is that everything counts. A company must have visibility and response capabilities beyond its own perimeter. Okay, um, that's going to wrap it up for my piece. I'm going to sum it up this way. For various reasons, a company needs to have visibility beyond its own ages. Sadly, while the ways to events productivity grows because of clever cloud-based applications and services, so too does the attack surface in ways to attack. It would be wise to have some protections of the company name and key employees because not all attacks are malware. And so at this point, Brandon, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Chris. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Brandon Dobrik. I'm a uh, senior product manager here with Looking Glass. I am in charge of our uh, threat intelligence platforms, uh, including Scout Prime. So following up uh, Chris's fantastic presentation, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the modern SOC uh, and what we can do to utilizing tools, uh, you know, individuals, and, and best practices um, enable our SOC. And, uh, We'll primarily focus on Scout Prime, but we'll also talk a bit about the rest of the uh, Looking Glass stack. So first and foremost, I want to talk about the fact that U.S. companies as a whole take an average of about 206 days to detect a data breach. Um, so that's as per the, uh, the Poneman Institute's 2017 cost of a data breach report. Um, and 43% uh, of all breaches across small, medium, and large organizations uh, actually have been coming via third party or vendors. Uh, and that's as per the SOHA Institute report. Now, these two statistics are important because they really highlight uh, one of the things that Chris was talking about. I want to refer back to his sort of diagram of the the perimeter defense that was traditionally seen in cybersecurity. Um, namely, what we're seeing from these two statistics is that it really does support the thought that perimeter defense is no longer enough. You know, if you do the traditional methodology of, you know, deploying firewalls, uh, deploying internal sensors, tracking net flow, looking at log files, breaches are taking on average 206 days to uh, determine and the attack surface is getting broader and broader through these third-party applications, through these vendors, through these entities that gain access to our, our walled uh, gardens, if you will. Um, you know, there, there, there's so many external attack vendors that we need to be concerned about, and adversaries are, are learning and adopting best practices to hide themselves once they're on your network and engaged in the active exfiltration, that ultimately we need to start taking a look at, uh, you know, threat intelligence. Um, you know, because of increased network complexity, there are more points that touch the internet for every company. 
Um, and because of that, companies really need to take this holistic view of their risks. Um, you know, it's, it's, as I was saying, it's no longer enough to deploy those sensors inside the network. Um, you know, humans are fallible. Tools really are not perfect. Uh, we, we have to give our attention to external indicators. Uh, and unfortunately, when it comes to the threat intelligence, um, there's too many sources. There's literally thousands of them, and they come in different formats, and they are of different uh, levels of veracity and trustworthiness. Um, and, and we need a means to, to ingest, to aggregate, to normalize, to sort the wheat from the chaff, as it were. Um, and that's really why we've begun to see the advent of threat intelligence platforms. You know, threat intelligence platforms, as opposed to, you know, the traditional SIM, uh, are not focused on dump every indicator in and ultimately create, you know, more work for the analysts as they, they sift through you know, every atomic level indicator. Rather, threat intelligence platforms are designed at doing those steps of normalizing and, and, and aggregating and deduping. Uh, and, and ultimately making analysts more efficient um, yeah, as per the Verizon uh, database incident uh, DBIR. Um, they were saying that yeah, alert fatigue sets in at 5,000 alerts. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to see uh, an analyst that can get through 5,000 alerts in a day, but that's what the report said. Um, and, and really what we're looking at in terms of indicators going into a platform over the course of a day, it's, it's in the number of billions. So even that 5,000 isn't enough if there isn't a means to, to prioritize and understand uh, what needs to be dealt with first. Um, and there's such a breadth of data. You know, there's the, the surface web, the social networks, the deep and dark web, um, everything from atomic indicators to breach announcements to you know, mentions and compromised account credential, um, we need a way to sort of prioritize on this data. Um, and that's something that Looking Glass has really been doing for, you know, in, in the form of structured data uh, since the you know, mid-2000s in the form of unstructured DRS surveillance acquisition uh, since the late 1990s. Um, and that sort of expertise allows us to uh, bring in the top tier data feed to prioritize the data that gets to the, the end user uh, while still having a platform that is easily integratable um, so that you can bring in your own data feeds, your own data types, and proceed to, to correlate and enrich with your own data on top of our own. Um, there has to be some sort of scoring or prioritization method. Uh, there really, there just aren't enough analysts. Uh, as per RSA, there's a 25% shortage. Um, and those we have, unfortunately, are actually clustering towards the lower end of the skill spectrum just because uh, a large portion of them were pushing out into the, uh, the workforce to you know, meet the need uh, earlier than they might otherwise be. And as a result, uh, you know, 10 plus years of trade traps that top analysts might have, um, the new individuals don't. So we, we do need to have a way to enforce trade craft that takes time to learn. Um, and we need to have a way to prioritize alerts to avoid that alert fatigue that ensures that the worst items are being dealt with first and foremost. Um, you know, the way that Looking Glass and specifically Scout Crime uh, addresses this as something that we call tick or threat indicator confidence. Um, at its core, it is a combination uh, score of, you know, veracity of the source or, or you know, source quality combined with the actual criticality of the threat. Um, and, and that is really an oversimplification. In actuality, what we do is we map the entire public facing internet. Um, and we overlay it with indicators of compromise brought in from uh, nearly 100 uh, unique threat feeds that through our years of expertise we identify as uh, critical or, or, you know, the highest quality. Um, and through a combination of, you know, machine analysis and actual human vetting, we distill those threats 
those indicators rather into the actual threats that they are indicative of. And we say that this threat is present on this network element. Um, and then we assign it a criticality score based on uh, the type of threat, the source that it originates from, as well as how it actually interacts with every other piece of that uh, network that is the that the you know the World Wide Web, um, and and that gives analysts, uh, you know, cyber threat analysts, the ability and means to prioritize what threats they are going to deal with first, whether it is you know addressing a particular type of malware. Um, you know, uh, that a, a drier malware is far more concerning to a banking company in the U.S. than it is to an energy company in North Africa or the Middle East, um, and you know, Stonewall, vice versa. So we need a means to to prioritize and address. Uh, you know, malware is more concerning than signs of spam. Phishing is more concerning than just somebody scanning your network. Um, all of these. Um, in the case of most stocks, their analysts uh, bucket or prioritize uh, what they address in a particular way, whether it is uh, regional concerns, uh, vertical concerns, vendor concerns, industries. So there needs to be a means to uh, collect all of this data so that the scoring can take place and prioritization can occur. Um, in the case of Scout Prime, we do this utilizing collections. Uh, collection is an aggregation of network elements. Um, and then through our collection management interface, you're able to interact with all of uh, a summary of both the elements that comprise it, um, as well as you know, the threats that are, are aggregated in there. Um, the nice thing is this is actually dynamic to build. Um, oftentimes, you know, we, we've been very focused on the, uh, you know, the vendor, the third parties the network elements outside of your own that you need to be concerned about because they can attack you, but they aren't, you know, uh, necessarily easy to understand. They're murky, they're shadowy. Um, one of the things that we allow users to do is actually build their collection based on BGP ownership information and based on our own insight into um, network space through our mapping of the internet, which means that, you know, I can dynamically build a collection on uh, vendor X or, or a particular vertical and continuously as new ciders are added or removed from there, um, the collection will continuously update and I will always be able to see where threat indicators sort of intersect with those network elements. Um, and those are common means of prioritizing for a SOC. Those are you know, by no means all of the ways, but you know, collections are flexible and essentially allow you to add personalized context um, for purposes of analysis. Automation. Um, yeah, we, we need automation to help overcome the, the dearth of analysts. Uh, now automation in this current form is essentially um, removing man hours, helping our individuals be more efficient at accomplishing the tasks that they're already going to do. Um, and, and for the SOC, the entire you know, threat intelligence life cycle is, is long and engaging. It starts from aggregation, uh, analysis, application, and, and ultimately so taking some sort of action. So looking less uh, you know, as a threat intelligence company, SCORE really owns all the parts of the threat intelligence life cycle. We do do the, the gathering, the aggregation, the analysis. Uh, we have our threat intelligence platforms for you know, um, publishing the data to and, and doing all of the investigation analysis that I was talking about before. But we also have uh, threat mitigation appliances as part of our service offerings and, and uh, threat intelligence platforms can then go to actually drive rules and drive policy into your threat mitigation based on uh, analyst analysis. So, the whole goal is you know, immediate oper operationalizing. That word gives me so much difficulty um, of threat intelligence, um, helping to really shorten that that life cycle from collection to analysis to application. Um, you know, a, a phishing site has an average half life of about six hours. 
Um, and in many cases, the, the firewall rule lifecycle between identifying a threat, going to the firewall admin, creating a rule, testing a rule, deploying a rule can take four to five times that long by the time the rule is even up the phishing site down and irrelevant. So we need a means to sort of automatically deploy these rules and policies based on what analysts are seeing. Um, and that's, that's one place where you know, looking glass through their threat intelligence platforms and uh, threat mitigation appliances really shine. Um, we have to take a holistic approach to threat intelligence. Yeah, Scout Prime ingests uh, data, correlates results, learns where there are threats, enriches it, and, and as I was saying with the threat mitigation appliances, orchestrates. Um, beyond that, there's the option for managed service. You know, we, we really are moving away from um, traditional fully stocked SOCs, and, and in many cases, larger companies are taking advantage of other people's expertise. Um, and, and Looking Glass, you know, has the better part of two decades in providing uh, cybersecurity analysts, both on the open source side and on the structural threat intel side, um, and you know, have analysts in house at you know, companies throughout the Fortune 100, um, and and they take advantage of you know our own platforms. Um, that the third party risk monitoring is, is an important part of that sort of holistic view that that looking externally to your network and seeing where threats uh, lie and, and how they may in turn intersect with your network. Um, and then ultimately, like I said, the, the scoring, the fact that there's both the global internet score as well as threat indicator confidence scoring as a means for uh, prioritizing and allowing analysts to become more efficient and ensure that they are tackling the biggest threats. Um, you know, integrations. One of my favorite things I have ever heard one of our customers say is integrations are the hill that projects go to die on when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, you know, Chris earlier said that there, there aren't enough tools. And on, on the one hand, I agree with him. On the other hand, I, I slightly don't. In, in some ways, there are too many tools because it's so hard to get the full security stack to talk together to succeed. Um, that's one of the reasons why I think we're seeing a consolidation in the security space, uh, which to its credit is helping the modern SOC because it's allowing people to own the entire you know, threat analyst life cycle, um, as I laid it out before. Um, but it's, it's important that any tools that we consider have an extensive API, anything inside of the platform should be API driven and the data should be available to get out to ingest in other tools, whether it is you know, taking indicators and publishing them to your next generation firewall or your secure email gateway for purposes of um, security orchestration. Um, things have to, have to, have to talk to different data formats. We're moving towards standardization um, in the format of sticks and taxi um, and uh, OpenC2 for, for orchestration purposes, but you know, there, there are still so many different formats and so many different formats even within Six, Six One in XML, Six Two in JSON. So platforms need to have the ability to talk to a variety of different um, services and data types out of the box. Uh, and, and ultimately, uh, you know, they need to be able to go directly into mitigation you know, or orchestration is the next step, the, the so what, if you will. Um, an analyst may identify a threat, but they have to go on to, what do I do with this data now? So just some takeaways uh, from this point. Um, you know, it, it is no longer enough to remain vigilant in your, your perimeter and your internal network. You know, companies do need to take an outside uh, view in security, and, and that's where threat intelligence is shining, but it's also where People need uh, tools and, and prior expertise to, uh, to help them take advantage of that. And that's one place where Looking Glass really shines and comes in. Um, cyber intelligence is not infallible, but it, it truly can help you protect your network. Um, you know, there is a value in understanding not only threats themselves, but the topology and the weak points of, of vendors and interested parties. Um, you know, something as simple as tracking threats as they move through your industry vertical can help protect you 
uh, understanding emergent vulnerabilities as they come out, um, you know, understanding things like patch cadence. Um, you know, we, we have to take an external view. We have to take a holistic view, open source, structured, you know, uh, private data sources, et cetera, et cetera. It has to be extensible. Um, it has to, have to, have to fit with our existing security profile. And, and ultimately, we need to have the so what. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Chris. All right, we've got a few minutes left here at the end of this section. Let's uh, go through a few of the questions that have come in to the audience. Um, and if anybody has any additional, go ahead and submit them now. This would be a good time to see if we can get them a, a addressed. Let's see, the first one, gentlemen, it says, why can't my current tip provide me with insight into where indicators intersect with networks outside of my own that I'm concerned with? I think that's going to be more or less Brandon's thing. I was going to, I was going to ask, I, I, you know, I mean, I know that also you have multiple threat feeds. Is there, are there specific uh, threat feeds? I'm, I'm a asking a question with a question. Are there also like specific threat feeds for financial services? You know, for for industries. So that was kind of rude of me, but um, you know, uh, the, the question was basically about. Um, uh, threat feeds from outside of your network, and I, and I added to it, what are kind of different types of uh, threat feeds as well? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to touch on uh, both of those points, and, and I do think they somewhat go together. Um, uh, on the one hand, uh, the point about sort of seeing where threats intersect outside of your network, um, you know, it, it is, I should say, it's hard enough understanding your own network space, especially in smaller companies, something as simple as an IT ops team changing over or poor documentation can actually lose um, what resources are up, what ciders are registered. Um, if there are, you know, IPs or IP ranges subleased, uh, it can be lost very quickly, let alone having that same level of understanding for networks external to your own. Um, so having a tool uh, in, in the case, you know, of looking less at Scout Prime, that has that specialty in mapping the internet and understanding what resources belong to who, uh, that gives you that insight that other platforms don't necessarily have because they don't have that same um, expertise underlying it and, and functionality that grows out of it. Um, Chris, to your question about the, the um, yeah, threat feeds that support different data types, there are, um, you know, there are things that come out of the different certs uh, different ISACs publish their own uh, threat intelligence types, um, oftentimes in you know, normalized formats for their um, their members to take advantage of. Um, you know, and, and uh, external individuals can can petition or or you know purchase them, depending on the uh, the type of organization that it is. You know, FS ISAC, um, the Financial Services ISAC, has their own. Uh, data feed uh, comes through that their own taxi server and everything. I, uh, yeah. I believe the aviation ISAC has their own. Um, you yeah, know, the U.S. CERT puts out ones that uh, recommend. Uh, sorry, I should say ones that are you know, applying to particular industries and verticals. Um, as, as well as there are you know private companies that specialize specifically in. Uh, particular verticals or industries oftentimes growing out of uh, individuals or analysts that had formerly worked in SOCs for those industries. Awesome, Brandon. Thank you. There's a couple more that have come in. Let's go ahead and move on to these. Let's see. The next one says, how does Looking Glass follow the threat intelligence life cycle as you've outlined it? I know you covered a little bit of this, but Brandon, you want to go a little deeper? Yeah, absolutely. So, as, as I mentioned, um, you know, Looking Glass in its current form is actually multiple companies that have come together. Um, you know, Looking Glass, which uh, grew out of doing uh, threat analysis on structured threat intelligence, Cyvalence, that was the sort of original open source threat intelligence gatherer um, analyzer platform, um, and then um, Cloud Shield, which is a, a specialized threat mitigation appliance is actually utilized by uh, our very own government for uh, 
protecting you know key resources uh, so looking glass has very much focused on this threat intelligence life cycle we take pride in the fact that we own the entire portion we actually produce uh, 17 or 18 specialized uh, proprietary feeds in-house um, beyond that we do send our, our you know open source and, and structured threat intelligence across our own our own analysts and our own cyber watch center uh, for human vetting uh, ultimately that gets pushed down and published into our threat intelligence platforms um, you know scout prime being our primary one um, ctc for open source data um, and and now with uh, with scout threat and scout events um, based on the the threat types coming in uh, or the indicators that we see we can provide recommendations based off of the expertise that comes out of our cyber threat intelligence group um, you know oftentimes as i was saying uh, customers will you know, have us provide them with analysts or with, with the managed service offering, in which case we can take care of addressing their situations for them, whether that's um, reaching out to vendors or recommending best practices or recommending remediation action um, through our you know, Scout Threat Scout event platform. We have recommended playbooks that say, in this situation, if this threat occurs and this is your security profile, here are the steps that you take to remediate, you know, go to this tool, log in in this way, perform this analysis, essentially uh, enforcing tradecraft onto you know, new analysts, providing them with guidelines and outlines. And then ultimately we take that threat intelligence and we dump it into our threat mitigation appliances for, you know, automatic blocking, um, uh, you know, zero touch, low touch, uh, depending on your offering. Um, and, and, uh, we do it in a very granular way, you know, do uh, full path block URL block, which means that we can actually block uh, malware and, and bad sites that are hosted on otherwise benign domains without talking, uh, taking them down, as well as uh, doing some interesting stuff in, in threat mitigation based on scoring more than just, you know, base block and allow. So it's really the, that entire life cycle from gather and aggregate um, analysis scoring and, and ultimately publishing it to a threat mitigation appliance. Very good info, Brandon. And let's let's expand on that a little bit with this last question that just came in. Um, someone was asking, my current tip doesn't provide a way to operationalize the intelligence it, pro it provides. How is Looking Glasses different? So um, they, they Sort of twofold. In in the one case, there's the the API uh, and and our own sort of expertise in taking our data and integrating with uh, with external platforms like everything for whether it's your you know security email gateway, your uh, your SIM, your um, orchestration software, next generation firewall. But also, you know, Looking Glass is unique in that we are the only ones with a specialized threat mitigation appliance that integrates seamlessly with our platforms and with our data sources and uh, really automates the threat intelligence process and, and the threat mitigation process and, and is a zero touch um, appliance. Awesome, Brandon. All right, gentlemen, um, there's a couple other questions that came in that looked at, like they want some one-on-one -on -one attention afterwards. So we will definitely address this with you guys that have sent those. Uh, Chris, Brandon, I appreciate your insight today. Chris, would you like to say a few words before we say goodbye, before we wrap up? Yeah, I, it's kind of a neat area that that you uh, are working in with uh, Looking Glass. Um, the idea that there's uh, extensibility beyond the SOC, I, I think, is out there. Uh, the, the kind of the needs that you're addressing with uh, not just alert prioritization, but really threat prioritization and kind of the way that uh, – you got movements with malware and, and considering multiple factors and how you should address uh, you know, an oncoming attack vector, I think are important. So, um, you know, and, and I was going to say that as an industry whole, we are seeing, um, you know, the, the SIM providers trying to prevent, present more uh, relevant and tighter information about the threat uh, intelligence, uh, uh, what they're seeing in threat intelligence and scoring. We see some prioritization from vulnerability management companies, but we also see the rise of uh, really uh, companies dedicated to doing threat intelligence and threat intelligence uh, scoring. So 
um, you know, it seems like that at least at this point, uh, Looking Glass is a certainly competitive offering and in, in an important uh, cybersecurity technology that's coming up. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. And you have been a, a wonderful, well, very welcome presenter with us today. We appreciate all of your time. Um, and to the audience, just make sure that you see that we do have the attachments. We do have a white paper that Chris has presented. So that's there for you to download here. And if you don't have a chance to do that, we'll also be sending out to our attendees um, after today's webcast. Uh, but thank you for everybody else that was on our live webcast. We appreciate you being here. We also will have a copy of the on-demand version of this on our webinar pages on our website. Um, if you'd like to take a look at that or share it with your colleagues after the event. This last slide I'm going to go ahead and advance to. This has some of our contact information if you'd like to reach out to us. Um, it has Chris's as well as ours on the Looking Glass side. Um, and Brandon, you as well, we definitely appreciate your time and your expertise um, in elaborating a little bit further on Looking Glass's offerings. Uh, but without any further ado, we're almost up to the top of the hour. And again, I appreciate everyone and thank you for listening to today's webcast.